Good afternoon, all. It's a real honor to be here and a privilege to be uh, uh, wishing Dr. Gordon a happy, happy birthday and to thank him not only for the fine work of the commission, but for his enormous contributions to our field. I feel privileged to have known him for 30 years. Um, scary, right? Um, anyways, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm also a little in awe. I'm apparently the last panelist of the last public uh, presentation of the, uh, this version of the Gordon um, uh, Commission. And the only thing standing between some of you and getting on the freeway and missing some of the fresh hour traffic. <laughs> And again, you may not want to get on the four or five, so you may want me to talk a really long time. <laughs> and there's really a lot to talk about, okay? because um, with others who have spoken uh, this afternoon, uh, the, the Gordon Commission reports lay out um, a very good agenda a very convincing argument on the need to change our conception of assessment, a very cogent argument about the need to better create assessments of learning and the important mission that assessment for learning uh, can fill in the improvement of uh, education for all students. Um, I'd like to offer a few suggestions and comments on some of the recommendations, so let me move to that. Others have talked um, about the better future for assessment that the commission reports lay out. Uh, Ed Hartle, Karen, Norma uh, uh, talked about uh, the compelling vision for future assessment, assessments of learning that uh, map to the full range of capabilities and dispositions that students sorry, really need for future success, usable knowledge, the ability to access and evaluate information, to reason and think critically, communicate, to innovate, to solve authentic problems. Those are important assessments of learning that can help to signal to educators in schools what's really important for kids to know and be able to do. But more importantly, assessment for learning that empowers teachers and students and provides them with the feedback they need to accelerate kids' learning ever forward to these very important skills that they need for success. They talk about assessments that are personalized to individual talents and interests and that we use these strengths, these individual student strengths to develop full potential. Assessments that recognize the multiple pathways through which learning and knowing and doing exists. Assessments that are fair and equitable, and Charlene talked um, a lot about this, that will provide our students bridges and not barriers as they have in the past to future success. Assessments that capture the complexity of both the process and the outcomes of learning and take into account uh, the social interaction and the social context of learning. Assessments that are valid for their intended purposes and are supported by evidentiary arguments that are consistent with those intended, person, uh, intended purposes. Uh, KR20, uh, Chromeback Alpha, uh, IRT growth curves are wonderful inventions, wonderful metrics, but they're not the end all and the be all for all assessments. Perhaps we'll finally get to instructional sensitivity. Um, perhaps we'll get real on the meaning of quality formative assessment and quality classroom assessment. Some of these messages um, have echoes in unfulfilled promises of the past. Remember John Dewey and Ralph Tyler, 30s and 40s, criteria and reference testing of the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, to have tests worth teaching to and performance assessments of the 90s. Not a group to Santa Monica CA. <laughs> <laughs> We had numerous false starts to 
to changing assessment so that it targets what's really important for students to know and be able to do. But today, we mount the charge, I think, with new enthusiasm, or at least I'm enthusiastic. I've been here a really long time. Um, because of the confluence of a number of factors, which any of which can still go wrong, as Carl um, reminded us. Number one, we've got the Common Core State Standards. They actually incorporate deeper learning and um, reasoning and critical thinking and problem solving and the like. And if we're going to have assessments that are aligned with our standards, they have to address the right stuff. Secondly, the affordances of technology provide new opportunities for effective assessment. And I'm guessing that my good friend and colleague, Luca Baker, talked a little bit about um, the affordances of technology. And the consortia, I know, are depending on technology to be able to score all those open-ended and performance assessment tasks we've just heard about. But that's just the tip of the iceberg for getting more nuanced perspectives on student learning kind of detail we need to really push learning forward. And finally, we've got a confluence of stakeholders, I think, who are really, really interested in doing this. We've got educators for the Common Core. We've got business interested in 21st century skills. We've got big foundations behind us and the like. At the same time, we have opponents that, as Carl mentions, it can get in the way. So we're in a good place. We seem positioned to move forward, but we have to be ever vigilant if we're actually going to move forward. And in paving the way to a better assessment future, the commission has been smart in thinking ahead to how they can help educators and states to move in the right direction by educating stakeholders about why and how assessment must change by providing research on assessment practices and effects that can inform state and local decision making um, and improve practices at all levels, by helping states and districts make good decisions in their assessment purchases, um, and by paying special attention to the equity challenges that uh, Charlene talked about, and by evaluating and informing the improvement of currently available assessments, starting with part and smarter balance. Let me know. However, I worry about some of the minefields in uh, carrying out this mission. We need to do more than simply educating folks that changes in assessment are necessary. Talk to any teacher, talk to any administrator, talk to almost any parent. They know that standardized testing is not the end all and be all of student learning. They know that it only measures a narrow part of the curriculum. Um, I don't know about your neighbors. My neighbors talk to me about the narrowing of the curriculum based on assessment, and they don't even know I'm an assessment person. But they don't even are aware of this over reliance. And after all, the federal government did make a quite a considerable investment consortia test. However, knowing that something is true and persuading folks to make the necessary investment to actually take action to change things is something different entirely. In fact, one of the reasons assessment is so popular as a policy option is it's relatively cheap compared to what else you could do to actually change practice. Yes, we should provide states with decision-making roles for selecting new tests so they can make the best possible choices. And I think uh, as you came in, um, you got the brief uh, led by uh, Linda Darling Hammond uh, and some of the other of us in this room and elsewhere to, to come up with criteria for choosing the next generation of tests. But getting beyond the nods and yes, yeses um, to assuring that states will actually invest the resources they are going to need to invest to pay for these better performance assessments. Um, uh, it's just one example, is a really big challenge. Remember the validity criteria and CLD tests you're supposed to meet? Do you like your NCLD tests? Do they meet those criteria? Are those criteria in the law? 
we need to be careful. Um, a caution, the communication task is sizable, the persuasion task and the implementation tasks are enormous. And secondly, uh, another page from Carl, I think. Yes, of course, and we can and should evaluate the validity, utility, and consequences of park and smarter balance. But let's do it with an eye toward improvement, toward lessons learned. Uh, let's not evaluate them against an unrealistic standard. Well, we in academia, I think, uh, tend to let the perfect get in the way of the good. Let's not do that with part and smarter than us. Let's, let's help cities move forward with really new and interesting interventions. And the commission is quite right, I think, about the need for long-term commitment, at least 10 years. That's probably an underestimate. As for researchers, we always can find something else to research and develop. Um, the commission calls for an expansion of the targets of assessments and the methods and evidence through, we assess, through which we assess those targets. Their attention to the details of process and context, I think, is going to require us to move beyond uh, traditional psychometrics that are so, so ingrained in this country's experience. We have a culture of efficiency that cleaves to the cost advantages, the reliability advantages, um, uh, uh, and the uh, efficiency of multiple choice tests or selective response tests. We have a litigious society that provides another obstacle. Our policymakers want to turn everything into numbers, better yet, a single number from which they can judge everything and anything. Um, talk about a communication and a persuasion challenge. Uh, it's going to take a real culture shift to move towards from numbers alone to more sensible, moderated expert judgment, informing judgments of process and uh, performance. The commission is quite right, too, about the range of expertise that will be needed to produce a new generation of tests, tests that, can, that will reflect meaningful learning, assessment that can fuel meaningful learning, uh, assessments that are part and parcel of teaching and learning. Yes, it will take specialists in content, curriculum and teaching, learning, cognition, measurement and assessment, special populations, um, English language development um, and the like. We do need to rethink the way we develop assessment tools. And a couple of questions here. If assessment for learning is part and parcel of teaching and learning, as many of us believe, why would you separate its development from that of curriculum and instruction? Shouldn't they be developed together? Wouldn't it be better to develop integrated packages of instruction and assessment? Can we engage in collaborative research which serves the dual purpose of research? and developing better curriculum materials that actually embed good assessment, um, a la the kinds of models that uh, Lewis and, and Tony have been talking about of late. Um, or even on a more practical level, should part of the commission's call for better assessment also include decision-making cues for purchasing instructional materials? That is, the new materials developed for the should incorporate assessments for ongoing teaching and learning rather than these assessments being an afterthought as they currently are. Um, and finally, the commission calls for more attention to assessment for learning. I'm sure this also comes with a call for teacher capacity because we all know that that's going to be an issue as we roll out this new mission. We can provide all the tools we want. We can't be teacher proof. Teachers don't have the knowledge to use the tools well, the tools will not do what we want them to do. So, this is a very pretty picture that shows Joan's view of how uh, an integration.
integrated assessment system out of work. You start from where kids are with rich goals. You take them to where they need to be. You will use ongoing formative assessment levels to percolate the, the learning um, that empowers teachers and students to learn and develop. You use interim, rich interim assessments to get formal measures along the way, and that's how you get to these end of year accountability tests where kids are succeeding. Um, so I think um, my view is very consistent with the Gordon Commission view, and that's a very long way of saying I think it's a great vision, and um, I hope that we will all get together to push it forward. Thank you.